don't want to do that. They like to be sort of free flow and they don't like to do a lot of planning ahead. Like, who are this week on Backward Compatible, Jim and Chris open a series of discussions on repetitive elements in games, beginning with the hallmark grinding of JRPGs. Plus, impressions of Tokyo Mirage Sessions FE and Pokemon Go. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 70 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, Games and New Media with a Splash of Academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, guys. And uh, Doc is actually over in Europe right now. I think at the time of recording, he's in Oxford uh, taking... Oh, oh, oh wee oui, wee. Oui. <laughs> yeah, well, You're supposed to say France uh, before I brought that in. Yeah, I was, I was about to say Oxford is not France. <laughs> uh, but he was in La France. Uh, so, yes, there's... La, La France. La France. <laughs> well, he's, he's speaking Francais. He was in La France. Uh, but yeah, um, but are, are you saying your high school French is better than mine? Well, I actually never took high school French. This is all uh, Duolingo French. So, well, neither did I. So there we go. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it's the same level. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Doc had a, a little stop off in uh Pelly before, uh, proceeding over to, uh, Oxford for a class he's taking for his, uh, graduate program. And so, uh, Jim and I today are doing, uh, sort of working from home, I guess you could say. Uh, we're calling in through Google Hangouts and, uh, we each have our own microphone and we're going to talk about, I believe, um, repetitive elements in gaming. Specifically, we're going to probably hone in a bit on JRPGs, uh, kind of the grind that happens with games like that and the, the repetitive elements and talking about what works, what doesn't work, um, and why some games that are repetitive might seem more fun than others, even though they have but, kind of on an objective level very similar mechanics. Don't worry. The conversation itself won't be a grind. Hopefully. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> uh, but first, we're going to get uh, started with some opening segments, including the button mosh. For the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. All right, so recently I picked up uh, Tokyo Mirage Sessions hashtag FE. I'm not sure if you're actually supposed to say hashtag or what the symbol is, but it's the it's the hashtag symbol. Um, and I realized the other pound day sign. the pound sign symbol. Pound sign. We can go with that. Uh, <laughs> the I figured out the other day that because uh, originally this game was uh, Shin Megami Tensei Crossfire Emblem. Um, so that's where the FE comes from. I figured out that uh, Tokyo Mirage Sessions, TMS, is not uh, Texas Motor Speedway, uh, but if you swap it, it becomes uh, SMT, or Shin Megami Tensei. Um, so kind of a clever little uh, titling there. I haven't played any of the other games in the in the series. I've only played Persona 4. Um, this reminds me a lot of Persona. Uh, it has the same sort of elements of you've got your real world and you've got sort of the other world. And whereas in Persona, the theming is all about uh, Jungian psychology, um, this one is all about um, Japanese pop idol culture. Um, so it's it's really it's it's really weird. It's very stylistic. Um, they do this interesting thing, for example, where uh, Jim, I'm sure you've seen in some anime where they, when they have background characters, they'll just sort of make them gray silhouettes or maybe pick a color, make them all the same color silhouette. In this one, you've got the silhouettes for all the background character characters. But they're very multicolored and kind of like bright pastels. Um, so it's a very colorful game, very um, very stylistic. Uh, lots of J-pop influences, the music, all that sort of stuff. See, that's what I was going to ask you about <laughs> specifically the J-pop because the game seems to be almost geared towards people that are really into um, not just anime but specific types of anime mm -hmm. that, that have a very heavy J-pop presence. Yeah. You know, high school anime, that kind of thing. Are you... Are you really a big fan of that style of anime? Or do you also listen to J-pop on your free time? Uh, well, the answer to both is not necessarily. Um, <laughs> I, I, I like J-pop every now and then. Um, I, I like uh, J-rock better, but I don't listen to a ton of either. Um, 
that being said, it's it's one of those things where we talked about games with stigmas as uh, kind of a bit of a, a, a bit of a guilty pleasure every now and then. It can kind of be fun, um, and it's also fun just kind of like if you're, you're I'm not taking it too seriously, and so some things will happen in the game. And actually, my brother was watching me play a little bit of it, and I saw this thing happen for the first time when you uh, I forget what exactly they called it. I think it was like a fusion unity or something like that, where you get this special ability for your character, but they go through this little like ritual that makes it happen, and um, You've got your your player character, and then you've got their uh, sort of companion, the uh, the equivalent of Persona in this one. I think they call them Mirages. And so the Mirages in this game are all based on Fire Emblem characters. Uh, and that's part of how they tie that tie Fire, Fire Emblem into it. But they like sort of go through this little thing where, um, and it's all voiced in Japanese. There's no English dub for this. Uh, they go through this thing where they uh, do, you know, fusion unity, and then they like fly around, and, like strike all these poses, and then like there's this thing where like they're flying through like this like empty space, and like there's like this bro fist that happens, and then like a light shines, and they like strike this pose afterwards, and so it, it's very, uh, it's very, it's it sounds very much like uh, you know like either. Um, Super Sentai, which we would know here as Power Rangers mm-hmm. or Sailor Moon, yeah, is kinda, what it sounds it like. It kind of feels like that. Both of those kind of yeah. mixed in. There, there's a there's a straight up uh, Magical Girl style transformation scene early oh, in the yeah. game. Um, and the other thing that was kind of funny about that, now that I'm thinking about it, is what as opposed to Persona, um, which like they sort of make a few assumptions and they kind of like speed things along. And there's like a couple little things that don't make sense narratively, but you kind of let it go. Uh, and this one, it's a little bit harder just to let it go. How, for example, these characters get pulled into this other world. And then at one point they kind of just like know what to do. Like they say, like, you know, uh, you know, you know, carnage form transformation or whatever. And they go into this other form and like, wait a second, you guys just like discovered that there's this other being that you kind of have this connection to. And all of a sudden you're, you're looking at each other, nodding knowingly saying the thing and turning into the thing. You know, So it's, it's a little bit weird in that regard. Um, but overall it's a, it's an interesting experience so far. Um, the gameplay, uh, Feels like Persona, like I said. Um, it doesn't have the same day-to-day sort of management stuff, at least not so far. Um, the combat uh, does some interesting things where, uh, I think I've mentioned before in Persona 4, you have the um, you try to down an enemy by using an attack that they're uh, weak against, and then you sort of try to follow that up and keep them from attacking you. And this one that doesn't happen so much, but you do have a thing where you attack with a particular type of ability, and then you can do what's called a session, where someone else has another ability that's designed to follow up to a specific type. So, for example, if I have a, uh, a Lance special ability, um, I have special abilities on the other two characters that are kind of like semi-passive that say, when this attack lands, then I follow up with this, then the other person follows up with something else. And so you can get these long combo chains going. Um, so it seems like that's going to be a lot of the gameplay later on, is customizing your characters to optimize the um, the sort of like session combo-based stuff. Uh, another little clever note, uh, the the or just another note in general but to wrap this up, is the, the tie-ins with Fire Emblem are kind of subtle, um, but very interesting. Uh, here and there, you'll get like little jingles from Fire Emblem when you level up. For example, you get the do 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 um, the, the characters, like I said, are based on Fire Emblem, the, 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 the otherworldly characters, um, even though the style is completely different. Like it's, it's kind of a game that's built up from the ground up, I think, to be Tokyo Mirage Sessions, but with the Fire Emblem influence. Um, but like little subtle Fire Emblem things, like uh, one of my favorites so far is you go into this shop, and it's just like you know a, a Japanese style convenience store. But the person behind the counter strikes this pose that lets you know that it's uh, Anna, the uh, like the sales, the merchant lady from Fire Emblem, yeah. and she has that like very like sort of trademark pose that she always has in the menus. And when she does that, um, it kind of like hits you that that's her because you don't notice it at first. She's just like you know a modern person. Um, but it's just like little subtle things like that to kind of remind you it's Fire Emblem, even though it definitely wouldn't strike you necessarily as a Fire Emblem game at first glance. This week in gaming history. Yesterday, which uh, for, for y'all listening, I don't know when this is going to go out, but on July 9th, uh, 1981, Donkey Kong first appeared in Japanese arcades took about until the end of end of July. The sources are a little bit um, wonky on that before it came to the U.S., but that was its first release um, anywhere in the world in Japan. Uh, Donkey Kong, obviously, is one of the most well-known um, arcade games ever. Um, it's also one of the most 
um, prevalent when it comes to high scores. There's a lot of people. There's a documentary made, King of Kong, uh, specifically about uh, the journey of trying to beat the high score on, on Donkey Kong. Um, one of the things that Donkey Kong is, is, is notable for, aside from just introducing characters like Donkey Kong and Mario, when he was originally just known as Jumpman, um, is that it actually told, and it's actually in the Guinness Book of World Records for this, um, it's the first game to tell a complete story via cutscenes. Huh. And if you think about it, it actually does. Because when you start the game, they have that initial cutscene where it, you know, it shows um, DK taking Pauline. And um, at the end, you, know, you have like that reunite scene. And then DK falls down on the, um, you know, from the little tower. Mm-hmm. And they do it like, in different ways depending on which stage you're on. And then they have after like the last quote, last stage, and they of course they repeat stages. It kind of goes on forever, but um, at a certain point, it's like, yes, you've really saved Pauline this time. <laughs> For real, it's like, okay, just kidding. Now restart the whole game, and then it just keeps kind of going, and it gets progressively more difficult. Everything was faster, hmm. but um, it does. It is actually the first game to do that. These are all like little animated cutscenes, and one of the things the game was actually quite um, well known for. One of the things that made it so well received by the general public. Um, was just all the character that uh, Miyamoto was able to put into. Of course, he was he's the designer on the game. Mm-hmm. Um, that he was able to put into the game. So all the characters, they have very expressive faces. The animations are very expressive. Um, and it just comes... I mean, when Donkey Kong falls and he bumps his head, he has this ridiculous, like, bulging eyes. <laughs> and it's, it's very almost Disney-esque. And I think that really appealed to people because that was something you didn't really see much in arcades at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was something that, you know, especially the story elements were expanded on in later entries of Donkey Kong. Like, for example, Donkey Kong Jr., the very next entry that came, you know, I believe in two years later in 83, I think. Um, that one actually had even more story elements to it because you actually got little cutscenes in between each stage. Where, like, every time it's like, oh, look, you've saved your dad. Ha ha, no, you really haven't. And, you know, <laughs> it becomes this whole little extra thing. And it's so, – so it's kind of interesting, you know, where it went. And, and I know – Cutscenes kind of get a bad rap sometimes in games because they tend to, some, at least nowadays, take up way too much um, time. Yeah, but uh, you know, I think that they're certainly useful if you use them sparingly, and then you let the rest of the game kind of tell its own story as you play through it. Uh, and Donkey Kong's a pretty good example of that. It's not a game you think of as a game that has cutscenes or has a story, but it actually does. <laughs> This is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. I think, uh, Chris, both you and I can talk about uh, uh, the game because we both played it. Uh, Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go. It's kind of Pokemon Go. It's kind of become a uh, little bit of a sensation when it released. I think it had the most downloads of, of any mobile game within what was it like the first 12 hours um, or something like that i was reading it's like of all time it had like an absurd amount of, of downloads. it wouldn't surprise me uh it's yeah it's interesting to me um i'm, I'm not surprised so far at its success or its popularity at the very least and i'm sure you and i are the same and that's been completely saturating our um our news feeds yeah did you want to talk a bit um just just about like how it actually plays for those that maybe haven't played it. Sure, and I mean I've not played a ton uh, at the time of recording. I'm only level three, um, but I'll, I'll <laughs> so much. Yeah, so. I'll, I'll, don't feel too bad. I'll preface this briefly by saying that uh, well, I'm sure some people in our audience know already that the people who are working with the Nintendo on this is uh, called Niantic, and Niantic is uh, now I think a subsidiary of Google, and they made this other game called Ingress, and so Ingress was kind of the original quote unquote. Um, geolocation based game where you'd go around and you attach what they call portals to um, real world objects and it's things like uh like significant landmarks that aren't necessarily say businesses so if like there's a statue somewhere or if there's um a sign for a park or um you know a church or something like that um you can you can sort of submit these places and then it gets approved and then you're allowed to sort of attach a portal to it and it's a territory control game where you've got these two factions the enlightened and the resistance um and you're basically trying to take over portals and then you put these special objects on them i can't explain it entirely i I can't explain it too well i've got some very good friends who have played it for years now very actively um and so they could tell you more than i could but you're trying to basically triangulate um these areas so you get you capture three points with special items and then it sort of forms a field between them and so you try to control territory with these fields and you can try to knock down the other people's portals to remove the fields that sort of thing um 
So that's how they sort of do the geolocation. So same company teamed up with Nintendo to make Pokemon Go. And uh, the thing that strikes me right away in Pokemon Go is that it's not kind of like the dream that some of us I'm sure had where it's you go out into the world and it's just geolocation based, but it's like any other Pokemon game, right? Where you are, right. you're the trainer and you're walking around and you encounter a Pokemon and you have a Pokemon battle, you try to catch it. And it's sort of just like, you know, real time, you know, world scale Pokemon. That's not what this is. Um, Essentially, what you do is you walk up and you find a Pokemon based on your location, and it will appear, and you actually can have um, AR so that you have your camera pointed somewhere, and it tries to sort of position the Pokemon on the ground, or whatever it thinks is the ground. And then you yeah, you sort of like yeah. swipe your finger to toss a Pokeball at it, and if the Pokeball hits or comes very close, then you'll usually catch the Pokemon. And let me say something about that because when I first started playing the game, there's like there's no instructions, which is interesting. Like there's no way it doesn't really tell you exactly what to do so much. So when I first encountered a Pokemon, um, I didn't know that I was supposed to swipe the ball at it. I thought mm. I was supposed to drag the ball on top of oh, it. Yeah. So I kept doing that and it wouldn't work. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? Uh-huh. What the hell am I supposed <laughs> to do? I just kept doing that. And then like by accident, I, I swiped like kind of near mm-hmm. it and the ball kind of like shot out. I mean, I totally missed it, but I was like, oh, maybe I'm supposed to do that. Right, right. And then I actually captured it, but it was a very frustrating experience and I felt very old when it comes to <laughs> not understanding like mobile. Cause I'm sure that's like a convention that mobile games use a lot that I probably should have known. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, I think the way that they're approaching this is that, um, Pokemon of different types are going to have different starting CP levels. I think CP is combat points and, uh, that kind of indicates the Pokemon's strength. Um, and I, I believe that they have like, there's kind of a standard attack and then a special ability. I'm not, I haven't done enough combat right. yet to know how it works, but like, you don't have to fight the Pokemon to catch it. Um, once you've caught it, it's added to your collection uh, and you're trying to fill out your Pokedex. And so in a way it's kind of like a collection based game. You're trying to walk around and find, um, more Pokemon to add to your collection. And then, um, the way they sort of bring the portal idea into it is that those same points at which you could make portals, you can have what's called a Pokestop. And I think at some Pokestops they can turn into gyms. Um, and essentially what you do is people on the same team can go to a gym, assign one of their Pokemon to it. And then people who try to visit the gym can try to fight the Pokemon. And from what I've heard, I've not tried it yet. You can like swipe to dodge and you can tap to attack. Um, so there's a little bit more interactivity than just kind of like saying go and having the stats grind up against each other until one dies, um, which is a, was a fear of mine. Um, so not full on Pokemon battles, obviously. And I'm sure that, um, you know, type plays into it. You know, fire is going to be grass and waters or grass is going to you know be um, resistant to water, that sort of thing. Um, so you still have to be a little bit strategic and you have to know your Pokemon. Um, but really the, the emphasis is on moving around, um, finding the Pokemon, catching the Pokemon. And I think you collect enough of them of the same type. Uh, for example, all the, uh, Rattatas that are, um, very common in the world, all the, the rats and bugs <laughs> that people keep finding. Yeah. That's, that's um, all I ever, I saw, I, I found so many, I actually have three rats already <laughs> and like, I just stopped collecting them after a while. Yeah. They're all different. They have different CPs, by the way. Yeah, the they, ones they, I found. Yeah, it's slightly different CPs. And I think that what you do is like you get a few free items. Like uh, I think they get like, for example, with the Rattatas, you get Rattata candy and then something else. And so you can use those items to power them up. Or if you have enough candies, you can evolve them. And so I think the idea is that in order to evolve a Pokemon, you have to catch enough of the same type. Uh, if that makes sense. Now, I could be totally wrong about this. I could be a little bit off. Um, okay. Well, we'll probably report back at some point when we've played more to uh, confirm yeah. all this. And and the interesting part about this, and I think I think that'll conclude our mobile minute, mm-hmm. but I do want to talk more about Pokemon Go, just kind of like the meta element of it. Yeah, definitely. This is the Gaming Meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. What I've kind of noticed is that because there's like so little information that is actually within the game people have kind of had to figure things out for themselves and there's there's this understanding where i mean i know it because i looked it up and you've already talked about the gym battles but um there's there's people that have no don't even know that that's even a possibility yet right, but they yeah. play the game mm-hmm. and they've been playing the game for a while and so it's it's there, there's a little bit more to do that people don't even know that they can do so i kind of wonder like j- is there is there more that maybe i haven't heard about um mm-hmm. like let me just tell you this story just to kind of, cause I think it's kind of interesting. Sure. Um, you know, last night I went out, um, to go watch UFC 200 over at, um, the Fox and Hound mm-hmm. 
And I, I went over there with some of these guys that um, I train with in uh, jiu-jitsu. And um, some of these guys are pretty tough guys. One of the guys, um, actually, he's uh, 6'4", and he's about 210 pounds, and he's training for an MMA fight in two months. Oh, wow. And I'm sitting there with him, and then this other guy who's like, uh, who's like a blue belt that's, that's really good that's been training for like two and a half, three years. And they're talking – like the blue belt just says we're sitting there starting to watch uh, you know, the preliminary matches. And he's like, hey, so you guys been playing Pokemon Go? Yeah. <laughs> and I was like – and I just sat there like, wait, did you just say that? And then uh, the, um, Taylor is the, uh, the guy who's training for the, the MMA fight, and he goes, oh, yeah, I just found – I forget what it was. Uh-huh. Like he found something in the, in the bar, and he's like, yeah, I just found it right outside. <laughs> and I was like – I was like, what world am I living in now that apparently Pokemon and I mean, Pokemon Go specifically, mm-hmm. but Pokemon is like so mainstream mm-hmm. that people that are sitting there, including like people training for like MMA fights that are watching, a, you know, UFC 200 are talking about Pokemon Go yeah. as opposed to like the upcoming fights. Mm-hmm. I just thought that was very interesting and completely unexpected. It, it blew me away. Yeah. I didn't even know what to say it, for like the first it, like five minutes. It's interesting to me because the... I'm, I'm surprised and yet not surprised at how much this has taken off. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that Niantic had this other game, Ingress, and, you know, that's fairly popular, but it's still pretty niche, and I'm sure there are a ton of people who have never even heard of this. And now right. with the... Yeah, sure. ju- just by slapping a Pokemon skin on it, and granted there are other changes to the game, it's not just now that it's Pokemon, but the fact that it's Pokemon has instantly made it this, like, worldwide phenomenon um, where, like, probably even more so than they were expecting. Like, you're going to have, like, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people playing this game who have picked it up, you know, already a ton of people have played it, and it's kind of become a a cultural phenomenon. The first 24 hours, there were already kind of, like, jokes and memes and all this stuff coming up about it. People are uh, talking about which team they're choosing. Like, uh, there's, like, the blue team, the red team, and the yellow team. And that determines, like, your kind of, your allegiance with your gyms you know you kind of can team up with people to make stronger gyms you try to take them down i think when you take down a gym it becomes your team's color um and so you know it's kind of like you know friendly competition friendly rivalry um i think i even saw a picture somebody posted where a cafe uh had drawn out the symbol for the blue team i think it's team mystic um and said like you know 10 percent off your order today if you uh, are in team mystic um you know so like it's it's already this cultural phenomenon and i'm sure it's going to keep getting bigger as more people get into it and it's i I will say that of for the gameplay even though it's extremely simple it's very accessible too and it has that it has that appeal of going around the world and exploring and discovering something um that even for gamers and non-gamers alike because the gamers are kind of getting this exploration this discovery in a new way uh the non-gamers are sort of experiencing it for the first time, the sort of thrill of finding something in the world and then catching it and collecting and, um, you know, sharing those experiences with people. Yeah, and and it's it's very interesting because there's been all these images online of people finding different places and finding gems in the weirdest spots. Or, um, like, for example, did you hear about... um, You're aware of Westboro Baptist Church, correct? Yeah. Kind of a... um, I would argue it's not even really a real church. I actually think it's a troll organization just to get money to use their lawyers, lawyer fees and stuff like mm. that. Um, but they do a lot of horrible stuff, like they'll protest at funerals yeah, and no, things like that. I'm not a fan. Um, well, I don't. I don't think anyone is except <laughs> for them. I think they're like surprisingly universally disliked. But yeah. um, the thing is that someone actually um, put at a. Um, it is a supposedly unstoppable um, a clay. F- I don't even know how to pronounce these. By the mm. way, excuse me. A clay fairy or cliff fairy? Uh, cliff fairy. Is that what they're called? Yeah. So one of those is at the Westboro Baptist <laughs> Church. Like, like it's there. Like, you can battle nice. it. And, uh, yes. And someone just, it's, it, um, what is it? Let's see. I, I think someone made, uh, yeah, a, love, made a gym. Love is love. I'm looking at the picture. It's like, it's like ridiculous. And it became this whole thing. Oh, yeah. The name, the name is love is love, <laughs> by the way. So just as like kind of part of the joke. Right, right. So it's obviously, obviously that was known from the church, put it there. It's clearly someone is, is trolling back at the church. I think it's pretty hilarious. Right. But um, um, I think little I, things like that. I think I saw one. The, uh, the White House has a, um, I forget exactly. I think it was a Pidgeotto. But yeah, there's a, there's a bird at the White House called Murica. <laughs> um, and <laughs> that, that, that's guarding the White House. Um, nice. Yeah. And, and yeah, the, and I think everybody's probably heard that that story at this point, but in case y'all haven't heard of living under a rock, there was that story of um, uh, this girl. I think she was like a middle school girl, right? I, I just heard a teenager. I'm not sure exactly what grade teenager. she was in. Uh, but yeah, she was out looking, um, hunting for Pokemon, and she was trying to go down near, um, you know, a, like I, I think it was like a river, like a, a creek, creek or yeah, something. Yeah, I think so. Water source. Mm-hmm. Uh, just trying to find some water-based Pokemon, and she goes over there, 
and uh, she ends up finding a dead body mm-hmm. while she's searching for the Pokemon. So now my initial response to that was, well, did she still find any Pokemon? Was <laughs> were they still around there? Or <laughs> Maybe find, found, no, a, but, um, found a ghost type, right, right, or something. Uh, no, that's but it's just it's wild. And and there was this whole thing I was reading online too. It, it kind of gets a little ridiculous where. Um, there is this Tumblr site where oh, – yeah. uh, not Tumblr site, but this Tumblr channel where they were talking – they even call channels. I mean, what is the deal? I don't even follow Tumblr. It's uh, like a Tumblr page or a Tumblr – a Tumble? <laughs> I don't know. A Tumblr Tumble. <laughs> uh, but but at this one, they were essentially um, – that must have been for you know shut-ins or people that just rarely leave their house. But it was giving them tips about what to bring when you go Pokemon hunting because you got to be careful. you got to be prepared. Mm-hmm. So it's like – had all these things like bottles of water mm-hmm. and like first aid kits and and you know flares in case you get you gotta EpiPens signal someone because like you're that. hurt. EpiPens, yeah, and it's it's like all these things like essentially as though they're going to be going off into like the wilderness for like a couple of days, yeah, and <laughs> just to go hunting for Pokemon <laughs> around your city. And I can I can see that happening too. Like it's not bad advice if you are planning to make an excursion like out into the wild, quote unquote. Like even if you're not going too far, even just like going a few miles outside, you know, past civilization where you're like you know there's no access to a phone or roads or anything like that i can sort of see you know there's some wisdom in being a little bit prepared but yeah it was kind of funny just because it was saying like oh yeah if you're going out just to play pokemon go for the day be sure to yeah. pack all this stuff <laughs> and so it's like it's, it's good advice and yet like okay guys like let's let's bring it down a little bit well <laughs> it what what, th- what that's told me was that because their, spe- their specific audience was to people that generally don't go outside so it's it's kind of i mean yes whoever wrote it is, is obviously a bit ignorant about about that and who they're talking to well, is probably well ignorant as well. You know, they're, they're, they're just trying well to... Well-meaning, right. Yeah. Um, but that's what I found interesting about it is that it, this this game is actually drawing people that don't normally want to go outside mm-hmm. outside mm-hmm. so they can actually play the game. Yeah. Uh, actually, on that note, um, it's interesting because I, I saw this little article where um, people are talking about how so far even they're seeing... Um, how it's been good for a lot of people's mental health. It's kind of giving them a reason to get up and go outside and be a little bit more social. Um, I think there was it was a joke, but it was kind of funny. Someone reposted a thing where uh, it said that Pokemon Go in the last 24 hours has done more to fight childhood obesity than Michelle Obama has in the last eight years. <laughs> um, hey, you know what? That, that that was a joke, but that's actually probably true probably if is. you look at the statistics because it probably got a – a lot of kids to actually go outside yeah. and that's the biggest challenge is to make them actually want to go outside mm-hmm. you can talk to them all you want about about fitness but they have to want to do right. it and this, this um, is yeah. going to be one of those things that helps them do that so <laughs> right and and the other story I, I, I wanted to mention too which i found was interesting and some sometimes these stories you can't always tell if they're true or not but i i want to choose to believe this is true so um apparently there was a 40 year old man who was who was out at night um playing Pokemon Go. He wanted to go out and find some Pokemon. He was in, he was in a public park, and he runs across these two uh, – a 40-year-old white guy. Mm-hmm. And he runs across these two 20-something black guys sitting at the park. And they saw what say, saw him walking around, and they said, hey, are you playing Pokemon Go? <laughs> and they start talking about Pokemon Go and because and, they were there too at the park looking for Pokemon. Mm-hmm. So they strike up a conversation. They're like, yeah, let's – you should join Red Team. We're on Red Team, man. And they kind of have this thing. And then – Shortly after that, a cop comes up, and he – the cop just assumes that because it's a 40-year-old white guy and, like, two 20-year-old mm-hmm. black guys that there has to be – like in, in a park at night that there has to be, like, a drug deal going mm-hmm. down or some sort of illicit behavior. And so they had to stand around and, like, talk to the cop for several minutes to convince him that, no, there's nothing going on. We're just playing Pokemon and Go. what's funny and about the that – the end of the yeah. story is that the cop also apparently – it ended with him downloading Pokemon Go to go play Pokemon Go. <laughs> nice. So, and what like so because that's a, that's a funny thing. It reminds me a little bit of Ingress again because I've heard stories uh-huh. from people who play Ingress who have to explain, uh, who have had to explain to police on multiple occasions what it is that they're doing wandering around you know neighborhoods and stuff like that at nighttime, mm-hmm. and like kind of looking like they're like stopping in conspicuous places and doing things, um, and they don't always get it. What's interesting is the Pokemon Go, because everyone knows at least what Pokemon is, even if they don't know what Pokemon Go is, you can now much more easily explain this. And so I think that it's going to possibly be the thing that I I think it's going to be huge. I think it's going to last a long time, especially as they continue to update the game. Um, That's apparently something that Ingress did as well as they upgraded the game with more types of interactions and more stuff that you can do. Um, But I, I think it's going to sort of be the thing that, kicks off augmented reality um, sorts of games. I think it's going to become a lot more popular. It's going to be a lot more appeal now that you've got Pokemon Go as kind of a reference point that a lot of people are familiar with. Well, so let me ask you this, because I know I know they obviously had to partner with Nintendo because 
Pokemon. They can't just use Pokemon mm-hmm. without permission. Um, do you think that uh, the game will expand into being more of a Pokemon experience with po- more more focus on Pokemon battle, battles, that kind of thing? Or do you think that Nintendo will look at the success of this game and then try to essentially work with the company to make another version that is a more robust Pokemon? That's a good question. Um, I could see it going either way. Um I think that there are ways that they could expand the current experience to make it more like a traditional Pokemon game. On the other hand, I think it'd be easier to build the the alternative from the ground up. Um, and so, especially now that Nintendo is branching out into mobile spaces, I could sort of see... Yeah, that's, that's why I was thinking about it, yeah. too. Same deal. But then there's also the question of, like, do you want to kind of compete with yourself? You know, do you want right, to have two exactly. different versions? Because um, you're, you're going to divide your user base between... And, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe you're dividing between... Um, the super casuals that have no interest in that mm-hmm. more robust experience, right. and then the ones that do could play the other. Yeah. But you run that risk of you're competing with yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, would does it water down both games? Right. Yeah. And so it, it's a really, I think it's a hard balance to strike. And the thing that occurred to me too is the the most Pokemon I've caught so far was just during like a ten minute drive. Um, my brother was driving, and we were just grabbing you bite to eat for dinner. And so uh, he was driving, and I was catching Pokemon just along the way. And what was nice about it is the fact that it was just I could tap on them when I saw them on the map, toss a Pokeball, and I didn't have to be st- sitting in the same place for too long to do a thing. And so I think that for most people, especially adults who have working lives, it's definitely something where you can be going about your business, stop for about 20 seconds, do the thing, keep going. Um, whereas the more robust experience would probably require more time. And it would be something where you're actually dedicating time to go out and play, you know, Pokemon, whatever. And and there were, and on that note, there's actually been, you know, obviously a lot of images related to this game, because very quickly, by the way, just spread all over the mm-hmm. place. There were businesses, uh, there, was a, there was a sign outside of a business that basically just said, um, Pokemon are for paying customers. Yeah, I saw that. Because people would, would, would go into the place, not buy anything, uh-huh. just to catch a Pokemon that was in there. And honestly, and there was a lot of a lot of um, blowback from that. A lot of people were like, well, how dare these people try to bar us? For me, I was looking at that going, that actually makes a lot of yeah. sense, and that's perfectly fair. You don't want people loitering in your business if they're not going to actually buy anything. Mm-hmm. You know, especially, I, I couldn't tell exactly, but it looked like some sort of coffee shop type place. or So it seemed like you could go in there and pay like, two three bucks for you know local coffee or whatever mm-hmm. is that really the biggest deal if you're actually are that into getting a yeah yeah one? or like you know staying outside <laughs> you know like or well what they could the, i think something about it was like they had to come nearby oh, okay and also even even standing outside technically if you're like on their property mm-hmm. is tech because like if you have like tons of people that are all up around yeah, business, yeah. <laughs> the people that actually want to go in can't go right in. right so it becomes and i can actually kind of see you just look at it from that perspective same deal there was like a company that was saying hey don't play pokemon go like it says something like work time is for work mm-hmm. play don't play pokemon go during work yeah. and people again kind of had that reaction that blow already um like state highway co- uh, associations and um our you know departments i should say uh yeah. have been coming out with these things saying like you know pokemon go can wait you know the same sort of like don't text and drive don't pokemon go yeah. and drive uh which all seems like pretty obvious stuff but you know but you have to say it i mean say i mean i i, I think it makes a lot of sense you know safety first if you're there to work at your job, you should be doing yeah. that. Of playing Pokemon Go, mm-hmm. if you go, I mean, and maybe just because I'm a little older, I, I think I think you need to have mm-hmm. that kind of you know work game balance. Yeah, but and I uh, think though, like you know, for example, if you're yeah. at work, and maybe it's different at work than at home because I think they they do use the maps to kind of determine what's a residential area, what's a commercial area, that sort of thing. Right. Uh, maybe the presence of other gyms nearby that says that there's more things that could be tagged as gyms says mm-hmm. that it's probably more public place, and we should put more types of Pokemon out here. Um, but you know, at least for me at home, I know that I have to go outside and I have to go someplace if I want to catch anything. I think there was like, aside from the starter Pokemon, which is always going to be right near you. Um, I think there was like one thing that I could get from my house. Otherwise, yeah. Are you telling me that the starter Pokemon, I didn't just happen to hunt it down inside my bedroom? Uh, I'm afraid you didn't, Jim. Sorry. I'm not that good. No, you're you're not that good. (laughs) Um, speaking of which, which one, uh, which starter did you get? Uh, Charmander. Charmander. Yeah, so did I. Um, yeah, I guess just my point there being that, um, you know, it's not a distraction for me here at home because I would have to go out, but I've heard that some people like at work, they can, um, get access to it, or maybe there's enough things around their office that they might spend less time working because they want to sort of walk around the building for a minute to try to catch a few or something like that. So, no, I, I, I think if it's like, especially how fast it is to catch them and people have breaks during work, if you're only doing it, if you're only catching something and it's only like, you know, a minute, Mm -hmm. a minute here, a minute there, it's not a big deal. But I could certainly see how in some in some work environments 
there's some people that would literally just get up and walk around the whole office and spend like half their day mm-hmm. on different floors of a building <laughs> and like going out out near the building and things like that just trying to get pokemon instead of doing their jobs so i can see how it can kind of take some people over yeah. And what's funny is we're having all these conversations, and it's only like 24 or 48 hours since release. Um, It's going to be interesting to see in the coming weeks and months and even years uh, how this develops. Um, It's a a really interesting phenomenon. I think it's going to be interesting to watch. Yeah, I completely agree. So we'll we'll see where it goes. Hey, we'll see if the next time we record, if it's even still a huge deal, because you never know. It could could be a little fat and people get bored. Fluctuate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I did want to mention this one tidbit before we move on. there was uh, – I, I found this information on – I forget who posted it, but it was on you know Twitter. And he was did, doing statistical analysis of different trends for people that would type things into uh, Google mm-hmm. and different search engines. And looking at the trends, and um, he was comparing it to very popular things that trend very highly at different, different peaks. So he was comparing it to Call of Duty and um, Game of Thrones and one other thing I forget which. Oh, I think it was Donald Trump. Mm. So Donald Trump, um, Game of Thrones – Pokemon Go um, and uh, Call of Duty, mm-hmm. and you could see like a, like they were all the, they were they were trending relatively high, and then Game of Thrones was like super had really high peaks near where the show was, and then kind of dipped down. Mm-hmm. And you could tell that Game of Thrones was, despite the others being well searched terms, Game of Thrones was like way up there, and Pokemon Go actually beat it. Hmm. And it was this thing where he was talking about how he's been looking at these trends for a while, and it's the first time he's seen something actually beat Game of Thrones. Wow. Um, and it was actually beating it not like at the current time, but it had beaten its its high score, like the high during its like season finale and season premiere episodes, hmm. just for searches recently. So now, obviously, is that sustainable? I don't know. Yeah, we don't know. But just to even hit just to even hit that peak and to be that prevalent in society is pretty impressive. Right. And now this week's meaty topic of discussion. So for our uh, media topic for today, we're going to be talking about repetitive elements in games, specifically JRPGs, Japanese role-playing games. Um, And really, the the main thing I want to talk about and kind of just zero in on is the concept of grinding. Mm -hmm. Because grinding is pretty much, it's not an, I wouldn't say it's in every JRPG. Sometimes they actually would really try to make um, it not matter and let you actually complete the game without actually having to grind. But most of them do have an element of grinding. Right. And sometimes it's successful and sometimes people look at it and say oh i hate grinding and i can't stand it mm-hmm. but yet some of their favorite games are jrpgs that have a heavy element of grinding it's just the way that the grinding is presented right so it's kind of that challenge of hey what what makes grinding good when is it a good thing when is it a bad thing and a lot of that obviously is subjective mm-hmm. but that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today and the first series I, i'd kind of like to talk about just kind of in general i don't know if you want to go just by series but i do kind of want to mention final fantasy just because it's such a it's everywhere it's such a popular series and it's also one of the oldest jrpg series Mm -hmm. and you know i don't know what your experience is with the series um i've i've played all of them Mm -hmm. and i started with the very first one on the nes and as i've mentioned before on the podcast you know it's obviously it's a very grindy game it's it's very heavy on the dungeon crawl aspect Mm -hmm. and if you don't grind if you don't consistently try to get your levels up you will lose especially later in the game Mm -hmm. very steep difficulty curve when you um, hit about the midpoint, a little past the midpoint of the game. And if you don't start grinding heavily, you will lose. You cannot continue in the game. And yet, it's one of my favorite RPGs, honestly. So, I don't, have, you, have you played it? Are you Have you experienced that kind of level of grindiness? I, I've not played... Um, I've only played a little bit of the original Final Fantasy. Um, I've not gotten to the point where like I had to grind to get anywhere. Um, well, also, which version did you play? Because that's important, too. Uh, I played. It was a, it was a remade version. It wasn't like the original NES. But which one was it? Dawn of Souls on GBA, or was it the PlayStation? Uh, it version? was actually on my iPhone. Um, so uh, I think that one uses the G because because the Magic system they actually mm-hmm. changed it and yeah. they kind of made Magic much more like the later Final Fantasy games. So mm-hmm. instead of having to conserve your Magic because you only had a certain number of spell casts, like D and D, they changed it to the MP system, and because the game wasn't designed for MP, it kind of broke the spell casting classes. Mm-hmm. Makes sense, and and made it a lot easier. So that's mm-hmm. why that's the main reason why I ask. Gotcha. Um, it it kind of changes that dynamic, but I mean, there is definitely still an element of grinding there. Mm-hmm. It's just not as extreme. Yeah. They also lower the difficulty quite a bit in, mm-hmm. in those remakes. I, I except did... for the PlayStation one. 
I did play um, the one that I played most recently, Final Fantasy, was um, thirteen. Uh, and that one, of course, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, people always complain about the <laughs> gameplay and being very linear and all this different stuff. And that one definitely did have an element of grinding where you'd kind of, you, oh, you, you knew when you got to the point where you'd be stuck because there's no other option. That's basically where you need to be going. And so when you just like fail miserably at that boss, it's like, okay, I need to go back. I need to grind for a while. And the grind in that game was not the, uh, was not the most fun. I actually, I, I didn't mind the combat. Um, I thought they had some interesting systems, um, but it was not the so, not the most fun so, to grind. So that's very interesting because I agree with you. I think the combat system in thirteen wasn't really. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it was like objectively bad. Mm-hmm. It was just. But yet, I didn't like the grinding element of it. And yet, mm-hmm. if I look back at the original Final Fantasy, the combat system was extremely simplistic. Mm-hmm. And yet, I didn't mind the grinding at all. Yeah. And so, what? What do you, I mean? If we can talk about like what, because there's there's something else going on here, and it's mm-hmm. not just well, if the combat s- system is interesting, people don't mind playing it for hours right, on end. Right. That's clearly not true. There's a little bit more to it, mm-hmm. and maybe when we say combat system, we're not we're being a little bit we're not being specific enough. Mm-hmm. Like for example, complexity isn't ne- more complexity isn't necessarily better. Right. right. But what do you think? Yeah. So this is actually something I want to talk about a bit too regarding this topic and. Um, you know, we're focusing on JRPGs today, but I think there's we can sort of preface this a little bit by talking more generally about repetitive elements yeah. in games. We, we can call it. We can. It can be our lecture series. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Keep coming back to it. Um, <laughs> but I agree. I think it has some legs. Yeah, and so. One of the things I think I've mentioned on the podcast before, and I've been trying desperately to find the original source. I forget where I found it originally, but um, Shigeru Miyamoto, um, who was you know a big name in Nintendo, we talked about him earlier with Donkey Kong. Yeah, um, he's kind of a big deal. He's kind of a big deal. If you don't <laughs> if you don't know who he is, you probably shouldn't be listening to this podcast. Um, <laughs> but um, he has talked before about his approach to game design, and one of the things that stood out to me, and I'm probably going to be wording this not exactly right, but he talks about finding the few core things, the few core mechanics that you'll be doing in a game, and trying to make sure that every one of them is extremely fun and pleasurable and not boring. Um, he wants it to be engaging. And so you take it, take a look at something like Mario, for example. Not everyone loves Mario, granted, but... Basically, all you're doing is you move, you jump, and occasionally get an item that lets you do something in addition to jumping. But it's very simplistic. Um, and so the entire game, all you're doing is moving and jumping and maybe using a special ability, right? Um, and yet they they find ways to take those very simplistic, very repetitive mechanics and put the Uben in situations where you have to kind of... Um, use it in a different way or encounter a new problem to solve using the same thing. And so something that is even more simplistic than some RPGs where RPGs can have very complex systems and lots of different stuff you have to keep track of and level up and, you know, you know, all the abilities to use when, um, somehow those feel more repetitive and more boring and more grindy, despite the fact that you have more complexity and you're probably thinking more about it. Um, and I think that there's something important there about making sure that whatever it is you're doing. And of course, different genres are going to appeal to different audiences. Um, but sort of as a game designer thinking about how you're going to make your mechanics speak to the player and keep them engaged throughout the experience. Yeah. And, and I think that's a very good point. And obviously I'm, I'm sort of person. I'm going to listen to whatever advice Miyamoto wants to give, yeah. of course, because <laughs> he's, he's more than proven himself when it comes to game design. But um, I was actually thinking about that as you were talking of what is it that made between final fantasy 13 and the original final fantasy. And I, and I, I really would go out on a limb and say that, the combat system itself in Final Fantasy thirteen is better. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is better than the original Final Fantasy, but I think what makes the original Final Fantasy grinding element more more appealing, mm. um, and this just to me, and this might not be for everyone, but I do think for those that like it, this is why. Um, the whole thing is, is, is a battle of resource management, and it's not just within the battle. Like, within the battle, you have to worry about your HP, mm-hmm. um, how many healing items that you have, and then also your magic, because magic was 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 limited in that game, as mm-hmm. I mentioned before. And so you had to be very careful. Of, do I want to use magic to beat this battle? Did you know if an enemy dies, you, there's no phoenix down. You have to you have to leave. You're so think, it's like you're thinking long term, right? So, you're, so the whole thing, the, the combat itself, every fight that you have is is put into this larger perspective mm-hmm. of the the entire battle in this case if you're in a dun- mainly if you're in a dungeon you're always because cons- that's the main part of the game so you're always thinking um what do i need to do to win this battle 
and use the least resources possible. And resources, whether that means uses of a magic item, items in your inventory, magical spells, mm-hmm. etc. You always are, are keeping that in mind. And, and the thing about that's different about modern some of the modern Final Fantasy games, 13 included, they don't think that way. They're like, ah, you know, a battle's just a one-time thing. Mm-hmm. We'll hear you. We'll heal you up afterward. Um, you don't have to worry about it. If it, if a person dies, whatever, you can bring them back. Or like, I think they just come back right away. If <laughs> I remember, I forget exactly. Like at the end of the battle, it's very much. It almost. It feels very handholdy. Mm-hmm. But aside from it being easier, I think the real problem wasn't even that it was easier. It was that it kind of broke that um, that experience in the gameplay where each individual session of combat felt like it was just its own. Um, completely removed thing. It was his own thing. Whereas yeah. Final Fantasy Original, all the combat was all part of this larger picture of yeah, the game. Right. It's, it's all that made it more interesting. Yeah. Right. And I think that's what made it so interesting. That's a really good point. And I think that, um, you know, to sort of follow up on that, you kind of mentioned this already, that I had more fun in individual battles in 13. Because even though, like, and some people would say, like, all you're doing is just hitting A constantly, but you do have to do the phase shifts where you go from, like, you know, a heavy attack to more of, like, a reserve defensive healing mode. And then, um, you know, try to, like, do the combo thing where you stagger them. And then you sort of go into, like, okay, now let's deal all the damage because they're weak now. Um, I'm thinking, like, it's it's more active, and I'm thinking more about the moment-to-moment stuff. Um, but, yeah, like you said, there's no there's no context built around it. In the original Final Fantasy, it's very much about planning for this whole um, delve. And I think another game that does that really well is uh, Darkest Dungeon. Um, mm-hmm. Darkest Dungeon is very much about um, thinking about getting through this mission. And it's, it's really... Um, I think they designed the game even more so than Final Fantasy to make you feel like your resources are very scarce and like you're really scraping by to get through these missions. And like a lot of times you have to kind of retreat. But, you know, it's kind of this really unfortunate thing that happens where um, you've gone yeah, through retreat, all this effort. Retreat is big. Yeah. In retreat, these games. retreat is big. And <laughs> in, in but the fact crawls, that, you have to know when to retreat. Yeah. But also just the <laughs> fact that you've, you've grinded so hard and you've gotten like 70% of the way through. And it's like, Oh, if I could just make that last thirty percent, I could just like at least get through it and finish it and be done. But like you also might know it's like I can't do it, and so you have to go back and you have to go through that thing again. Um, and oh, and, and that's the worst in, in dungeon crawl games, like the original, you know, Final Fantasy. There's no, war- I mean, I mean, until you get the warp spell, and even then, you know, I think there's, I think there's one at the end, like exit, where you can exit all the way out of a dungeon, but it's like a max level spell. Mm-hmm. But it's same sort of deal. Like warp is just one level, one level up, and again, you have limited uses. Mm-hmm. Um, but until you get that, sometimes you had to go all the way into a dungeon. You could get three quarters of the way through mm-hmm. and realize I can't beat, I can't go any further because the floors are too hard. I have to travel all the way back. I have to walk all mm-hmm. the way back up. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Darkest Dungeon, I haven't played it, but it sounds the same way where it's very much, you have to really know like, hey, I could beat this because if not, you're going to lose all of your progress. Yeah. Well, also you're going to lose your people. And um, oh, yeah. when, when yeah. people die in Darkest Dungeon, they're gone. And like, there's always replacements. Oh, is per- permadeath? It's permadeath. Um, and there's always replacement characters. But if you've spent a lot of time leveling someone up and getting their stats up and getting new skills, um, it hurts to lose a good a good person. Yeah. Um, Oh, that sounds brutal. <laughs> yeah, no, oh, it's a brutal game. It's yeah, it's Darkest Dungeon. That that, that title is not just an aesthetic thing. That's uh... <laughs> so. So so let's let's switch to kind of a different um, subgenre of um, JRPG mm-hmm. instead of the, ter- the just traditional turn based, and go to another jo- another uh, game series that has permadeath, Fire Emblem, mm-hmm. and specifically how grinding is also important in Fire Emblem too. But the battles are very different. It's right, just, it's a tactical RPG. Um, it's very much, it's almost like a war game, mm-hmm. um, e- although you have individual um, units as in one person as opposed to units of, of within your mm-hmm. within a war campaign or something. Yeah. But um, it's very important to grind up and level up your characters and be prepared for some of these later battles. Mm-hmm. But grinding is presented differently, don't you think? It, it is, and I think that in the newer games, and this is actually a really new phenomenon in Fire Emblem, the fact that you can do side missions to grind... And uh-huh. when we say grinding in this case, I guess it means like not focusing on the main story, going off and doing side stuff just to level up your characters, um, well, and then well, sort that's of returning. one element of grinding. Yeah, and, and and Fire Emblem has that, like you're saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but the older Fire Emblems, it was always there was no side missions. The only missions mm-hmm. you had were the main missions. And so, in order to keep your characters leveled up, you had to think very long and hard about not only who you were using, but who is getting final uh, final right. um, hits and stuff like that. Because whoever finishes off an enemy gets a lot more experience than just engaging and i would say that 
that's where the grinding element can come in too because you could potentially try to like rush through the battle with the more powerful characters right. or you can slow down mm -hmm. you can intentionally try to get everyone to get like a little hit on one character mm -hmm. before the one person gets like the killing blow right. and i would consider that an element of grinding because mm -hmm. it's, you're really not just i think i think the difference between grinding and playing through the game naturally is just when you're playing through it you're just trying to to beat it in the most efficient way possible right. and grinding you're trying to maximize your statistical advantage, your resource advantage mm -hmm. in the game, either one, because that's what RPGs really focus yeah. on. It's it's stats and it's resources. Yeah, and that's it's kind of differentiates them from other guns. It's it's kind of putting in the work now to have it pay off later. Um, yeah. and also feeling feeling the cons. It's it's very it's a long term sort of choice that you're making. And so even if you're not thinking moment to moment super hard about what you're doing, and you know you can be if you're sort of putting into this bigger context. But the the choice and consequence in these games comes from whether or not you're going to take the time, put in the work now to be more prepared later, or if you're going to sort of just rush through it now and then feel the consequences later of being basically stuck when you hit a wall. Um, and I, I, I think we mentioned before that that sort of study about the personality types and how it can apply to gaming that uh, Jason Vandenberg did. Um, and when we brought that up last time, I think I was talking about realism versus fantasy and how different people's personalities, you know, people who like their imagined world better or versus people who like the, the real world, the, the practical world better, are going to like fantasy and more like realistic simulation, respectively. Another thing he talked about was... Um, I forget exactly which term it was, but it was something about diligence or, um, you know, basically your your work ethic. It, it's not exactly that's not the word that they used, but there are people whose personality is such that they are very dutiful and they're going to get in and do the work. Um, and so they actually kind of will like games that are grindy and reward them for putting in that work where there's right. a bunch of people who don't want to do that. They like to be sort of free flow and they don't like to do a lot of planning ahead. La who lazy? Are, <laughs> Is that you, well, you just kind of I wouldn't necessarily say here. lazy. <laughs> um, but no, but I mean, like there's a, there's a personality type that like even if people know they have to do it, um, they're not mm -hmm. sort of geared that way. And so there are people that as soon as they hit a grind, it's like, I'm done. I can't play this game anymore. Um, and I think that I'm kind of somewhere in between. I, I kind of... It depends on the game, too. Sometimes I resent the grind, but I'll do it because I know I need to. And other times I'm like, you know what? I just can't deal with this right now. Well, but isn't it like like I said, it's like it's a, how you how the game presents grinding. And then if you're able to accept their reasoning behind it. Right. You know, and we talked about Final Fantasy, what their reasoning is. And then we talked a little bit about Fire Emblem, too. And specifically, and that's the same for all tactics games. It's like, hey, do you really care about leveling up all your other little characters? And in, in later Fire Emblem games, do you care about trying to get certain skills on your characters so that you can then have you know your the children of those characters be extra powerful right. so it's like it's a balance do you really want to do that or do you not care and you just want to try to work your way through it as quickly as possible sure. and yeah. especially when they added difficulty levels mm -hmm. it was a little more possible to do that yeah and i think that the newer fire emblems actually do strike a really good balance where they reward people who want to do that but they don't punish people who don't necessarily well they they certainly do on higher difficulty well, on levels. Higher difficulties, that's what I'm yes. saying. That's be, what I yeah, meant. That's like they add the difficulty levels on purpose so that if you don't want that experience, mm -hmm. you can go through and just kind of ignore the grinding element completely if you just play on lower, lower difficulties. Right, right. And that, and it comes into permadeath too, and I think that's part of the grinding because when you're playing Fire Emblem and you have permadeath on, um, and for the games that have you turn it on and off, and earlier ones it was always on, you have you run that risk if you're, if you're putting one of your um, combatants or one of your units into harm's way in order to get them to try to get a kill, mm -hmm. they might die. Right. And if they and and that's a risk that you're taking. And now you have to either start over that entire battle or just just accept they're dead. Mm -hmm. And so that's another risk of that grind. Yeah, I think that that adds a lot of, in my opinion, it, it makes all those battles a lot more tense. Mm -hmm. um, but meaningful decisions. Maybe that's yes, yeah. It's a it's a meaningful choice. Um, so. I guess we've kind of talked about you know dungeon crawls and traditional turn based and tactical tactical RPGs. Um, did you do you want to talk a little bit about grinding and like more action? I mean, because yeah. Final Fantasy thirteen is 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 action. It's like an action mix, like yeah. a turn based action it, it, ATB kind was, of game. Yeah, it was an interesting mix. Um, and there's a lot of games that are like that. And do you think that kind of changes the, your perspective on grinding? I, I think we, I think it does. Moving and, beyond just thirteen, of course, because yeah. that one we already talked. So about. So actually, um, another game that I might bring up and kind of, um, and it's not like full on action, and yet it is. Um, Fantasy Star Online uh, one and two specifically, I played a whole bunch of, and I actually played mostly um, the single player version on the GameCube, and you can do split screen as well, and I think there was technically an online thing you can do. I forget exactly um, whether or not you could, but I never did. Um, but 
that game was very, very grindy because it was it was an early MMO and MMO still will do this every now and then. But, you know, it's all about kind of like the, the grindiness is almost there just to make you have to play longer. Right. Um, and in Fantasy Star Online, the the ways you would do attacks is you actually press the button and you swing your sword or you shoot your gun or you use your spell or whatever the case might be. Um, and I actually really enjoyed it because it was it was. I, it wasn't something I had to think too hard about, granted, but like I'd go into a room and there'd be a bunch of enemies and, you know, maybe I'm not always in the mood for this sort of thing, but you just go up and like I, I like one of my favorite um, classes was this melee class. And so I had this giant sword and basically what would happen is you'd swing it and anything caught in the arc would take damage. And so I'm thinking about positioning myself and trying to catch as many enemies in the hit as I can without getting hit myself. And so there's the kind of this like constant engagement that you have that I think the action RPGs bring the turn based doesn't necessarily. And that's not to say the turn based is inferior. It's just kind of a different beast where no, it's 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 definitely different. Yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, I want to talk more about that because we I don't think we can have I know I know there's plenty that are not japanese Mm -hmm. but there's some that are but i don't think we can have a discussion about grinding without talking about mmos Mm -hmm. i just don't think we can and i think that that adds a different element to to the grind because in mmos it's almost like um the at least in my experience playing mmos extensively the actual individual combat itself is generally not that exciting Mm -hmm. and you're, the grinding element of it is just I'm going to try to get to the next level. Right. I'm just I'm just going to keep trying to get to the next level so that I can go on this raid with my friends mm-hmm. or with my guild or whatever. And it, and all, it's almost like the game itself, or at least the gameplay elements of the game, are actually just meant to be a grind. Yeah. And yet these are some of the most successful. We're talking about money um, games out there. EverQuest was was called for the longest time EverCraft. Yeah. It was that <laughs> addictive to people. And and World of Warcraft came in. When people didn't think there was going to be an EverQuest killer, it came in and it just blew everyone away with how many people played play that game and, mm-hmm. and to this day still play that game. Yeah, um, and I think that there are many many explanations for that, and I think the lot of it really does have to come down to the the payoff for your hard work. Um, in a way, like you know the the grind, as annoying as it can be, especially to certain people, there's kind of like this this sensation of like after having played for however many hours. Like of I made progress today. Um, I, yeah, I went from true. level forty one to forty three, and that was progress. Uh, or, even or you got you, you grind for sometimes equipment too. You know you're you're trying to get like a rare drop of some ring or mm-hmm. something, or you, and you you eventually get it, and it's like hey, I, I put the work in, I got yeah, it. Yeah, you play PvP for a week and finally get yeah. that new you know PvP gear. Um, right. And so I, I think that that is, and that's a very fundamental sort of game design. Um, reward structure you know you you have the player do something when they're successful they get rewarded for it and then they want to keep doing that for the reward um and so i think that you know that's one of the things that kind of makes grinding uh tolerable to people and i think that's very important then if you have a game that doesn't reward you either enough or at all (laughs) potentially for the grind um that it starts to become frustrating and um I think that, you know, a, another good example that I'm reminded of because it takes some cues from MMOs uh, here and there, also from uh, things like Diablo, uh, Borderlands. I'm actually doing a playthrough right now with some oh, friends. We're yeah, playing through true. Borderlands 2 again, and uh, we've got a party of four. And uh, first of all, I'll say that's a very different game between going from single player to multiplayer because even though there's more enemies and they get tougher, um, just the fact that you don't have to restart <laughs> a fight every time you die... Um, makes it much, much easier, much, much quicker, and having people able to revive you helps too. Um, so it's a very different, very different animal. But, you know, that one, I like the action RPG element because it feels like a shooter. You know, it's, a, it's an RPG, but it's a shooter RPG. And um, so even if I am grinding, and that in Borderlands 2 definitely is guilty of having very distinct walls. You know, you, you're able to go through and just kind of like, you know, you're leveling up in time with the game. And then there's that wall that you hit where it's like, okay, now I need to go back and do side quests if you weren't doing it already, which I always find kind of frustrating. Um, I, I don't like it when a game lets you kind of go through smoothly and then forces you to sort of like spike your grind, if that makes sense. Um, but at the same time, you don't present it as much as you might if it was like, say, a turn-based to like just wandering around a field and trying to find more enemies to kill in like a JRPG, for example, because when you're going out and you're doing those missions, it's a shooter and it's action-packed sort of 
thing. Well, well, like I said, it, 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 I think it honestly depends on the game and the way it's presented. Mm-hmm. Because I, you know, I, I actually really like turn-based games, and I think if if they do a good job of putting that grind in a context mm-hmm. um, within either, if you're really interested, in, like like I am, in things like statistical management, resource management, um, it it makes it very interesting because it, it adds this element of challenge. Where sure, you're you're inside a dungeon and you're going back and forth in a certain area trying to get these enemies to attack you. But it's for a reason, mm-hmm. and and it you have to you have to constantly be thinking. The battles might be simplistic for the most part, but you're you're always thinking. Okay, how can I? What is the least effort I could put into this? Least resources that I can expend to win. Mm-hmm. You never want to just go because sure, I, I could beat them in like a second if I use my ultimate ability, mm-hmm. but then I can't use it later, so I'm screwing myself. Yeah, um, and it adds that element. And I, I did want to talk about a little. Like I mentioned this earlier, and I called it the wrong thing, but. Um, Active active time time battles or active turn based right. essentially, and I'm talking about games like um, some of the more famous JRPGs, Chrono Trigger, mm-hmm. Final Fantasy VI, um, game uh, some games with interesting systems like Grandia, which is one of my favorite, uh, if not my absolute favorite, when it comes to turn based battles, the way that they present them. And these are games that, particularly when you get into something like Grandia or maybe Bot and Kaitos, I don't know if you played that one. Uh, I've part, wanted to. I've, I've never I've never played it, but um... Um, I recommend it. Actually, I can loan you. I've got both of them oh, cool. by the way cool. this is an aside very cool um but yeah so those games are uh, especially when it comes to grandian and bot and kaitos i actually like the battles in there so much that it it encourages me to grind like mm-hmm. even though and it, it has the extra the added context as well that i was talking about with some of the, res- the resource management elements to it mm-hmm. and it adds a little extra element um like grandia has the extra element of movement and how much do you want to move and there's this element of well, you know, if I want to do a melee on this person, I have to use part of my turn to run into their into range to hit them. But if I do that, then my next the next person in line who wants to use a um, area of effect spell, well, now I'm going to be in that area of effect, mm-hmm. so maybe I shouldn't do that. So there's there's extra st- strategic elements mm-hmm. that I think make it interesting. And then of course you're still trying to balance outside of the battle. It's not like everything returns when, mm-hmm. you're, when you're done. I'm reminded all of a sudden of one of my all time favorites, um, uh, Valkyria Chronicles. Um, that, I, I literally picked that up the other day, by the way, as an aside. I'm, I'm going to start it soon. Oh, like awesome. In a, in a day Let me know two. what you think I, because I, got it. I absolutely love that game. Um, and it has a similar element of it's a turn-based game, but it kind of does this interesting blend where as long as you are, you sort of like there's a map view and then you go down to one of your units and each unit kind of gets to move once, maybe twice per, um, per turn. And as long as you're moving um, and you're in this sort of third person sort of almost action view, um, enemies will shoot at you. So you have to be thinking about like where you're moving and how, um, how much uh, of your, um, you know, action ability, if you will, I forget exactly what the term was, but there's like a a certain amount of stuff you can do per turn and, you know, movement's one of those. Um, And so you might dedicate an entire turn just to going like as far as you possibly can. And then at the very end, you've lined up a shot where you like try to take a, take a shot with your, with your rifle or whatever the case might be. Um, and it's a, it's a tactical turn-based game, but with some sort of like real time elements that are really pretty interesting. Um, as long as you're on the defensive, like, you know, enemies will take pot shots at you as long as you're in your, the line of sight. Um, and so you have to think about like how long you're exposing yourself, um, which direction you're coming from, all sorts of stuff. It's really, it's a really cool, um, game. So it's not, and I think there is an element of a grind because you do level up characters. Um, and you do, uh, um, sort of get benefits for finishing battles and that sort of thing. So there is an incentive sometimes to do the side missions or to go back and play missions again in order to uh, be better prepared for the story missions later on. Well, I think we're we're uh, we're getting close to the end, but I do want to talk about one other game series which we've surprisingly not mentioned yet. But I think it's a, it adds an, another element to grinding that we haven't talked about, and that's Pokemon. Oh yeah, <laughs> and uh, which which is a Japanese RPG. It is is JRPG, and it's very different mm-hmm. in some ways, but it's also very similar in others. And I wanted to mention it because the way the grinding works in in Pokemon is actually more of a, at least part of the grinding. It's more of a collectible, like a collectability mm-hmm. kind of thing. You're you're out there, you're you're consistently trying to to build up your collection of Pokemon, mm-hmm. and that's kind of the reward structure. I mean even though the battles themselves are, are pretty simple. Mm-hmm. It's it's an interesting phenomenon in Pokemon because you've kind of got the main game and then there's the the end game. And it's it's all actually it's a lot like MMOs in that way. Um <laughs> where and what's interesting is because Pokemon is designed to be accessible by a younger audience, it has like an all ages appeal. Um as we've seen with uh, Pokemon Go, uh like we were talking earlier. Um right. but 
you know, kids who go into this don't necessarily know that they're supposed to grind. And so what you'll observe when you're playing a Pokemon game is that every two feet, uh, you're, you're approached by another trainer who wants to battle. And, uh, if you're anything like me, you start to get driven absolutely insane by this (laughs) because it's like, (laughs) I just want to get to the next town, you know? (laughs) And so you're, you're going through and like every two steps you take, you have to do another battle. But what it's doing is it's forcing the player to grind basically it's forcing them to go through enough battles to get enough experience to get their pokemon to about where they need to be in order to take on the next gym battle um and sometimes you might need to go back and do a little bit more but very rarely do you feel like you know we talked about borderlands has that wall that you hit that makes you go back um so you could choose to uh do the side missions as you go or you might choose to just do story missions and then go back for the side missions pokemon is different in that it kind of has a very level uh, upward trend where it's you're going to you're forced to grind so you're going to have the experience you're going to be just about ready to take on the next big thing um, but then once you get to the end game um, to like you know keep taking on bigger and bigger challenges you find that you do a lot more sort of self-directed grinding where you try to find excuses to get into battles you know walking around the tall right. grass that sort of thing in order to level up Pokemon to get more Pokemon um, and so it's it's different. It's interesting how how there's kind of like these two different approaches they take before and after the end of the game. And I think that also speaks a little bit to the type of player who wants to keep going after the end of the game. I guess can be expected to manage that a little bit better themselves. Yeah, and and so I think I think overall we we sort of have stumbled on the answer, and we've talked about it earlier. But I think the big thing about making grinding work is very obviously very repetitive element that could be boring potentially if you're doing the same thing, but if it's put in the right context and if you give people a reason outside of just the actual battle itself to want to do it, mm-hmm. they're going to want to, they're going to want, they're going to have that, that motivation to grind right. and, and really, you know, regardless of what that motivation is. And obviously you're not going to appeal to everybody. Mm-hmm. That's part of it too. But they're, they know, I think a lot of these games know their audience and they're at least, um, even if they fail, they're at least trying for a, a particular type of player um, that wants a particular type of experience. Mm-hmm. And so, so yeah, I, I think uh, I think that's the answer. I mean, what do you think? I, I think you're just about right. Yeah, and um, yeah, I think the thing you talked about with the the long term resource management um, plays into it as well. Uh, I was rereading uh, Raf Koster's book, A Theory of Fun, a while back, and um, I think that speaks very directly to one of the things he talks about, where um, the game gives you a chance to prepare for whatever challenge it is that's going to be coming yeah. up, and then. Um, the way in which and the degree to which it allows the player to prepare and then to feel like their preparation meant something um, is a very important element in making something fun. Um, and so I think that, yeah, you, I think you hit the nail on the head um, as far as making the grinding meaningful. Um, and now as for me, like I said, I'm kind of like in between. I don't mind the grind um, always. Sometimes I resent the grind. It kind of depends. I don't like grinding for grinding's sake. I definitely feel like I need to be you know, given an incentive, given a motivation. Um, and so, for example, I, I've sort of found even in uh, Tokyo Mirage sessions that I've had to do a little bit of grinding here and there. And this is even like the first main dungeon uh, beyond kind of like the tutorial dungeon. Um, where, oh, really? Yeah, I've had to do like... <laughs> That's kind of old school, actually. Yeah, I've had to do a couple of, you know, a little bit of grinding to get a couple extra levels to take on, you know, the, the mid-dungeon boss, if you will. Um, and so what I find that I, I kind of wish I was able to do, and this isn't exactly the right mindset to come into, say, a, a JRPG with, but when you're going through these turn-based battles and there is an element of making sure you're as efficient as possible in the battle itself to make sure that, like, you know, you get as many hits as you can um, without letting the enemy sort of fight back and, you know, take you out, I kind of feel like I, I, I want to have the agency to make the right decision in the moment, regardless of how over or under-leveled I am, um, that makes, like makes me able to succeed even if I am under leveled. Um, and unfortunately in games like this, that's not always the case where, you know, there, if you're too under leveled, it's just statistically speaking yeah. nearly impossible to win. I, I love games that, that give you that. And there are definitely some do that turn-based games too, that if you're skilled enough and you know what you're doing, um, it doesn't matter that you're under leveled. You can still win. It's just difficult. Right. And I love, I mean, you know, I know Grandia, I think, I think it's a really good example of being able to, still win if you're if you're very careful and you know what you're doing in terms of um uh, skill level bot and kaitos we didn't really talk much about its battle system but because it's card based Mm -hmm. and because you get to build your deck beforehand um if you know what you're doing and then you build your deck um very smartly Mm -hmm. 
and you you happen to draw into a good combination where you can just play a full hand all at once, mm -hmm. you can do so much damage. I mean, you can get through some of these battles that are very difficult. Yeah. I'm not saying it's easy to do, and actually with Bot and Kaitos, there's always an element of luck mm -hmm. because it is card-based, right. so you don't know what you're going to draw necessarily. Mm -hmm. But there is, a, there is a strategy to it, um, and because of that, and you can make the same argument, Final Fantasy Tactics, Fire Emblem, you can do it. It's just it's more challenging. Right, right. And I think that that can add a little, uh, definitely more of an incentive there too. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, uh, you know, just kind of like the, the note to designers um, in general is one, of course, know your audience, know what it is your game is trying to do. Think about what the grind means to your game. Um, why are they grinding? What's the reward for grinding? What's the consequence for not grinding? Um, making sure that you make it as meaningful and as fun as possible. Um, but also, you know, consider if there's a way to make it so that success is always achievable, you know, or do you want to make it so that success isn't always achievable? You know, that's, that's a very important design, right. design well, decision. And, and that's something, you know, when you, when you say that, it, I, would, I would sort of disagree that, that success is not always achievable um, just because you go into a battle underleveled. Mm -hmm. Because honestly, the reason why you're in that battle underleveled is because you chose not to level your character up mm -hmm. so it's more of a an idea of do you want do you want no matter what situation that they're in do you want them always to potentially be able to win mm -hmm. or do you how much preparation do you want them to have to do right you know it's like bot and kaitos if you just decide um you know what i'm not going to bother looking at my deck and planning out what my deck's going to be mm -hmm. i'm just going to throw in any cards that i feel like regardless of, of whether they match or not mm -hmm. If you do that, you're you're choosing to not prepare for battle, and if you go into the next, and you lose because you will, mm -hmm. that's your own fault. That's not really the designer's fault. No, so yeah, no, I agree. I agree. It it kind of depends on hey, do you mm -hmm. do you really want it to be how much preparation do you mm -hmm. want the player to have to do? And maybe that's zero. Maybe it is zero. Mm -hmm. You know, if it is zero, that's a choice. I I just think when you're talking about an RPG. Mm -hmm and you go zero preparation, I think you're probably in the wrong genre. You might want to switch right. to something like a fighting game where mm -hmm. it's all about your skill at that time. Yeah. It doesn't really matter if you've prepared or not. Yeah, and so like, you know, take an example of, say, um, if it's a if it's a if an action game with RPG elements where you're able to, through your experience, gain more abilities or maybe customize your character more, it's still right. possible to go through and beat the game with just the core abilities, even though it's, you know, it might be har harder, you might have to, like, wait longer for the right moment to use something. Um, and so more preparation means you have more control over how you play um, and it makes it easier because you have the right abilities for the right or to counter the right things that your enemies are going to do. Um, but it's still always technically possible. Um, but again, that's, like I said, action with an RPG element more so than an RPG with action elements. And so, uh, you yeah, know, just something to think through in the design process. Yeah. Like you said, know your audience and hey, know what you're trying to make. Yep. Know what you're trying to do and don't, don't deviate too far from that and try to please everybody because you're not going to do yep, it. Yeah, you can never please everybody. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode number 70 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, our discussion on, uh, oh, and or maybe the first of several discussions on repetitive elements and grinding in games. Uh, yes. And I, I wanted to say right before we close, uh, just for, for any of those hardcore Dragon Quest fans, I'm sorry we just didn't have time to talk <laughs> about Dragon Quest. But don't worry, we know Dragon Quest has plenty of grinding. Yep. <laughs> Guys, give us a comment if you want to talk a bit about Dragon Quest grinding. Well, we can respond to it next time. Yep, there you go. Well, uh, thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. And we'll see you next time. We want to join your discussion because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, backward-compatible.com. And we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.